the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins and the grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. The Gospel of Saint Luke in chapter 2, in verse 41, tells us a very interesting detail about the Holy Family. It says that the parents of Jesus, Saint Joseph and the Blessed Virgin Mary, went to Jerusalem, went up to Jerusalem every year for the solemnity of the Passover. I think it's beautiful for us and can help us in many ways to consider the relationship between Saint Joseph and the Temple of Jerusalem. We can draw many considerations from it because the Temple of Jerusalem continues to represent many things for us as Christians. Of course, the Temple of Jerusalem was a place of worship for the Israeli people, the Jewish people, the people of the Old Testament. When we consider the people of the Old Testament. They were the ones that received the prophecies. They received the law on Mount Sinai through, through Moses. They were the people that were liberated from slavery in Egypt. The people of Israel especially were instructed directly by God and through the prophets to believe in the coming of the Messiah and to look forward with him, to him, to look forward to the coming of the Messiah with yearning in their hearts, with love. They were especially taught by God that they were close to him, that God in numerous times would say, I am your God, you are my people. And this is a beautiful prayer that has entered into the Psalms such that we too can say, I, Lord, am your people. I, Lord, belong to you. I am part of your family. You are my God. It's interesting and it can help us to reflect when we use a possessive pronoun with respect to God. Oftentimes, a possessive pronoun indicates possession, control, ownership. How can any of us say that we own God or that God is mine? And yet we can, and he instructs us to do so. And he began doing so thousands of years, 3,000 year, years ago, through the people of Israel. To call him my God, in a St. Thomas, the apostle said, my God and my Lord, to Jesus. When we consider the relationship between St. Joseph and the temple, it helps us to consider how St. Joseph is a man of the Old Testament, but of course, a man of the New Testament. We can see in him a man of the threshold between the two testaments, the covenants, the covenant that was made in Mount Sinai and the covenant that is made by Jesus on Mount Calvary and with his resurrection at the Last Supper, at Pentecost, all of these tremendous events for our faith that accomplish and perfect and effect our redemption. St. Joseph, therefore, is at the threshold or at the cusp of this relationship between the two testaments that entail a continuity, a succession of events that are designed by God's providence. And they all reflect how much God loves us, how close he is to us. In fact, one of the constant themes in the Old Testament is that God is near. God is close to us. God is close to his people. And as the prophets announce this vicinity of God to his people, there is announced also this expectation for the coming of a new age, truly a new age in Christ, when God won't have to speak through the prophets to each of us because he will be present within our souls, within our hearts, within our minds, that the Holy Spirit will speak to each of us directly, that no one will have to explain the truths of faith to us because God himself will instruct us because we are children of God. The temple is the place where the most holy relics of the Old Testament were preserved in order to indicate the presence of God. The temple it was, and in a sense still is, the physical place 
where the presence of God is commemorated. And this is why St. Joseph and the Blessed Virgin Mary, along with Jesus, would go to the temple to worship God because it was this place of vicinity to God. The temple is also a place of offering sacrifices. And all of this is fulfilled in a marvelous way in the life of St. Joseph and in the life of the Holy Family. God is near to us. God is close to us. And St. Joseph had this special mission of being the guardian, the custodian, the legal father of Jesus, and also the spouse, the husband of Mary. And if we consider, isn't Mary, in a sense, the tabernacle? Is not she the temple of God? She is the ark of the alliance because God makes his home, his temple. He sets up his tent within her through this great mystery of the incarnation that takes place through this the miraculous conception in Mary's virginal womb by the power of the Holy Spirit who overshadowed her. And St. Joseph, knowing that he was legally her husband, he was, of course, perplexed when he saw that she was expecting a baby. And he didn't know how that could have taken place. And then he was instructed by the dream that he had at least four dreams in which God gave him special instructions in which he learned that his wife, Mary, is in fact the temple, that the Holy Spirit brought the divine shadow upon her and so that through that shadow and that power of God, she is now really the place in which God dwells, that he inhabits this universe within Mary. There's a, an ancient, he's not exactly a father of the church or a saint, he hasn't been canonized, but He's a holy writer from ancient times who's called Roman the Melodious, who wrote a hymn about St. Joseph and compared St. Joseph's attitude towards Mary after learning that she had conceived through the power of the Holy Spirit, that his attitude, attitude towards her is like that of Moses before the burning bush. With that presence of God, that miraculous presence of God that Moses saw with the bush that burned but didn't consume itself, just kept burning. That in an analogous way that St. Joseph felt that he must bend down, kneel down, prostrate himself, take off his shoes before Mary because she not only represents but is truly within her the presence of God. Now, this presence of God that is reflected by the temple, which we see the temple as this physical place, but that Mary, of course, as we enter the New Testament, the presence of God for his people becomes within Mary until the birth of Christ on Christmas Day. And then on Christmas, that presence is directly in the person of God made man who is under St. Joseph's care. So we see through these historical events of the two covenants, the Old and the New Covenant, of how St. Joseph being at the cusp, at the threshold of the two covenants, the two testaments, reflects this presence of God within us, this closeness of God. But God isn't satisfied, certainly not, by the Ark of the Alliance or by the Temple of Jerusalem. In a sense, he's not even satisfied by this miraculous conception of the second person of the Blessed Trinity within the womb of Mary. God wants to be even closer to us. He wants to live within each of us with his grace. He wants to adopt us as his sons and daughters. This, which of course marvelously took place also within St. Joseph, that his faith, his belief in the Messiah, even before the birth of Jesus, and then with the birth of Jesus and his accompanying Mary on the way to Bethlehem in preparation for Christmas, is all like St. Joseph going to the temple because he's living in God's presence. He's going to the temple to offer a sacrifice. He's sacrificing his whole life through every ordinary thing that he does that he understands is a preparation for the king who has come into this world whose kingdom will have no end, who is the king of peace and of justice, of truth, the king of love, of mercy, of joy. St. Joseph understood all of this and savored it in his heart and understood 
that his whole life was to be offered for this king and for this kingdom. The temple was, for in ancient times, a place of sacrifice. And there were animals that were brought in to be sacrificed. In fact, St. Joseph and Mary brought animals, turtle doves, to be offered in the temple. So we know if, if we ask how many times did St. Joseph and Blessed Virgin Mary go to visit the temple, well, it seems that even before the conception of Jesus, the Annunciation, even before that they regularly went as holy, pious Jews, they went up to the temple to worship God on the solemnity of the Passover. But we know that there was that very special moment which we commemorate in our liturgy, concluding the Christmas season, which is the presentation of Jesus in the temple, sometimes also called the purification of Mary. We see it in the tradition of the church both as a feast of the Lord, a feast of Jesus, and a feast of Our Lady. In fact, everything really that regards our, our Lord Jesus Christ and his life also regards Mary because he comes through her. We receive him through her so that we can also go to Jesus through Mary. Well, that feast, the presentation of Jesus in the temple, it commemorates that real event that took place 40 days after Christmas when St. Joseph, this pious, just man of the Old Testament, also believing fervently in the Messiah and knowing that his legal son was born to redeem the world, to become the king of the universe, as was revealed to Our Lady at the moment of the Annunciation, that St. Joseph realizes that he is bound by the Old Testament law to bring his firstborn son up to the temple to offer him to God and to offer also another sacrifice along with his son, two turtle doves, for instance, in exchange in a sense, but it's really a, a rescue. It's uh, paying a ransom for the, the, the firstborn son. And this was because it, this all commemorates what took place with the original Passover in Egypt. And it commemorates how the firstborn male of both little boys, older men, and animals in Egypt were all struck down by the angel of death that night of the first Passover in which the Jewish people marked their homes with the blood of a lamb that they had sacrificed and then consumed all of this beautifully anticipating typologically with a providential and prophetic anticipation of the Holy Eucharist. So the, the Jewish people were instructed by Moses, who had learned it from God, that they should paint their doorways on the outside of their homes or their tents with the blood of a lamb, and that that would protect them and their families from the death that was coming to strike down the Egyptians because of their pertinacious rejection of the one true God and also the rejection of the Jewish people. So St. Joseph, aware of all of this and knowing that he was obliged by the, the old law to bring his firstborn son, while fully knowing that what, he wasn't his son by flesh and blood, it wasn't his seed that led to his conception was the Holy Spirit. And that Mary still miraculously a virgin while having a baby boy 40 days old, that the two, Mary and Joseph, took their son Jesus to the temple to offer him to God. Now this is the first time, that 40 days after Christmas, is the first time when this presence of God in the world, which is the temple, is met by this presence of God in the world, which is the God-man, God-made man, the incarnate second person of the Blessed Trinity, in which Jesus is reverently, piously brought by Mary and Joseph to the temple, offered to the temple, when it's like, well, this is it's sort of absurd. Well, it's certainly ironic that why should God himself be offered in sacrifice? And it's because God so desires to redeem us God so desires that we might be able to offer something that is pleasing to God that he gave up his only son. This is already foreshadowed in that moment which we celebrate as the feast day 
of the presentation in the temple. When Joseph and Mary go up to the temple with, with uh, baby Jesus, just 40 days old. There have been recent excavations in Jerusalem which have d discovered new areas around the temple. The last time I was able to visit uh, Jerusalem and to visit the temple and to go and pray there, there's the, the wall, the western wall, sometimes called the Wailing Wall of the temple, which is the, let's say, the most significant part of the temple that continues to remain. We can go up and we can touch that wall. Perhaps we've all seen uh, the videos of popes like St. John Paul II praying very devoutedly and at the wall, touching the wall reverently, realizing that this is not only the place that the Old Testament revered as the presence of God, but it is the place where Jesus himself prayed, where Jesus himself preached, where Jesus himself was presented as an offering in sacrifice to God. Well, I mentioned these archaeological discoveries recently around the Temple of Jerusalem that ironically are related to uh, a dig in order to put in a new parking lot, it seems. And the, the Israeli government has uh, authorized a very careful archaeological excavation. They found some shops dating back 2,000 years where it's um, some, some archaeologists hold in fact, I was told by our guide, there is the, the very place where Joseph and Mary bought the turtle doves in order to present to the temple along with Jesus. And then as we approach the temple to go there to pray, our guide, who is Jewish, said, if I were Christian, I would take my shoes off and go barefoot because this is the very place where Joseph and Mary carried Jesus up these steps to go into the temple. What a beautiful consideration for us to put ourselves into the gospel scene, the presentation of Jesus in the temple, and therefore desire to present ourselves. If the temple is a place of sacrifice, animals didn't satisfy our Lord's desire for sacrifice, for atonement, for reparation, for adoration, for thanksgiving. The only thing that really satisfies his desire for reparation, atonement, adoration, and gratitude, petition, is love, the freedom of love, our giving our hearts. He wants the freedom of our hearts. And in the first place, what really satisfies God's desire for love is the love of Jesus who loves divinely because he is God. He is God and man. And because of the grace that we receive through baptism, we are empowered to love God back with that divine love so we can love God with all our humanity and even feel the Holy Spirit within us calling out God as Father, Abba, Father, so that we can not just call him Father and tell him that we believe in him and we hope in him, but tell him we love him and to tell him that we love him with our whole lives, that we want to offer ourselves in oblation and sacrifice to God the Father in all that we do. And therefore, this allows that everything that we do can be transformed by God's life and be made truly holy. So if we consider St. Joseph, who's in his workshop, perhaps making a table or making a door for a synagogue, which there's some really plausible legends that claim that St. Joseph as a skilled craftsman was sought out by towns near Nazareth in order to make especially sophisticated carvings in wood. Also, well, St. Joseph doing this kind of handiwork, craftsmanship, and he was being aided by Jesus, and we think, well, how easy it was for him to live in the presence of God. Well, maybe it wasn't so easy because Jesus just seemed so normal. He was, in so many ways, just an ordinary boy like other boys. So when, if we consider again St. Joseph and the temple, how many times did St. Joseph go to the temple? We know that he went up to the temple 40 days after the birth of Jesus. We know that he went up every year. And we know that because especially we know that he went when Jesus was 12 years old, when Jesus was lost and then found again in the temple by Joseph and Mary. And they found him asking questions of the teachers of the law and the Pharisees in such a way that it was clear that he was instructing them even though he was only 12 years old and didn't have any special instruction except from Joseph and Mary, that he understood the revelations in, of God in the Old Testament with a depth 
and a foresight, prophetic foresight, that was astounding. The people who, who heard him couldn't believe. And at the end of that passage in the second chapter of St. Luke, in which after Joseph and Mary find him, it says that Jesus continued to grow in maturity and in grace and in strength, and that he was obedient to his parents, to Mary and Joseph. So Joseph, knowing that his son, who's 12 years old, is God himself, that is greater than the temple, also realized that he would command him and Jesus would obey. It's an amazing, um, amazing experience. It can help us, as we contemplate St. Joseph, to have confidence in him and to go to him as children so that we too can call Joseph Father because Jesus called him Father, because Jesus obeyed him, so we want to obey him. St. Joseph has been considered for around 500 years to be, in a very special way, a teacher of prayer, a master of prayer. St. Teresa of Avila is one of the important saints in the history of the church, say in modern times, history of the church, who helps us to appreciate St. Joseph as the teacher of prayer. And this is because St. Joseph is especially close to Jesus in his sacred humanity. The only person closer is the mother of Jesus, the Blessed Virgin Mary. And yet St. Joseph is, well, there's a beautiful prayer that is, can be used for thanksgiving after Holy Communion. It speaks of how for hundreds of years, the holy people of the Old Testament looked forward to the coming of the Messiah. And now St. Joseph can hold him in his arms, can kiss him, can dress him, can take care of him, may see in him his own gestures that are reflected in Jesus' gestures because he learned them from his father, his earthly father, from St. Joseph. Well, what a beautiful prayer for us to say when we're giving thanks for Holy Communion, for receiving our Lord Jesus. To remember that for a thousand years more, that these holy people of the Old Testament were looking forward to receiving our Lord, and now we are able to receive him in this way that is just this tremendous intimacy where he transforms us into his being. So St. Joseph represents this closeness, this vicinity of God to us. He represents to us how the temple is a place of sacrifice and that we are called to sacrifice ourselves wholly by giving ourselves freely, entirely, with our whole heart to God amidst the little things of our life, especially our work. So to St. Joseph's work, his profession was as a car carpenter, a craftsman, an artisan. We too, in all the, the things we do, the simplest, humblest things, it could be even take, making our bed or taking out the garbage, we could think that I'm doing this in God, for God, through God, and with him, the way St. Joseph was with Jesus. And then that becomes a sacrifice which is pleasing in God's sight. Moreover, St. Joseph, as a teacher of prayer, shows us to enter into the scenes of this hidden life of the Holy Family so that the hidden life of the Holy Family, the hidden life of God, can also take place in our lives, in my life, so that I can find God constantly within my life that like going up to the temple can be right where we are. We don't have to go to Jerusalem because God comes to meet us. He's so close to us that he lives within, within us, within our hearts. The Holy Eucharist is really replaces the temple. Of course, Jesus replaces the temple. And the Holy Eucharist is the presence in this world of God, really, truly present. And it is the sacrifice because the presence of, of Christ in the Holy Eucharist represents his sacrifice on Calvary. And also those beautiful words of the Last Supper in which he, he foresees I mean, knowingly with his omniscience, his divine omniscience, that he's going to offer himself entirely for the people, for his people, for the church. All of this is present in the Holy Eucharist and therefore it is a powerful welcoming message to us so that we too might join in that sacrifice with Jesus who is our brother, in a sense he's our father too, but that in Jesus we can offer ourselves to God the Father. Of course, the church, which is the mystical body of Christ, Christ's presence on earth is through his church. His church, the mystical body, is made up of many members. 
the, the member of the church that is most excellent among creatures is the Blessed Virgin Mary. St. Joseph is very high up among those members. And then we have all, all the Christians, all the baptized, and all those people who really desire God, even if they don't yet know him fully as Jesus Christ. We all can taste, in a sense, and savor the presence of God within us. But the church is the temple, is the temple of God, is the presence of God in this world, according to the New Testament, the New Covenant. And Pius IX, blessed Pius IX, declared St. Joseph to be the patron of the church. So as we pray for the church and we desire that the church might be reformed and renewed and purified, that with the program of church management and with the Global Institute of Church Management, we desire that the church might be reformed and renewed to incorporate the best managerial practices in all of her institutions so that the light of Christ might shine forth the way the light of Christ shines forth in the life of the Blessed Virgin Mary, in the life of the church everywhere and in her institutions. Let us ask St. Joseph to look after each of us, to look after all those who support the Global Institute of Church Management, and to especially look after all of these church institutions and all of those who strive to live and offer up their daily work for the church so that the church might really be a shining light on the hill that represents the presence of God in this world. Our Lady, who's the mother of the church, will look after us all and help us to achieve this holy desire. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations that you have communicated to me in this meditation. I ask your help in putting them into effect. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my guardian angel, intercede for me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.